enforcement or pay any fines, and, and he wasn't going to have his rights suspended or his right to license or anything suspended. And then he turned around and walked out of the courtroom, and she was yelling at him in front of all these people to not, to not leave. And, um, but he, he, left, um, he left anyways, and he walked around the bailiff. The bailiff didn't touch him, and he got into the vehicle that he was there with and went home. Got home, there was a, a message on his answering machine that he needed to get back there. Oh, while he was leaving, the judge was yelling at him that his fine had risen from 350 to 425 dollars, and there was going to be a warrant issued for his arrest if he didn't come back and pay it. And, but they never served him anything. They never actually uh, came after him and arrested him. There were no warrants issued, and he had that confirmed through friends who were in law enforcement. Anyways, long and short of it is, on February 14, 2004, he was called over to a friend who was. A, uh, police officer's house and threw the newspaper at him for that day and he said read the front page and and this was February 14th 2004 the Bozeman paper and evidently and I never saw the paper but he read it to me when he got it and he says uh, Judge Carlson resigns from the bench and so my friend uh, Bill looks at the friend police officer and says so what's this got to do with me and he says she resigned because of you and he laughed and he said no way that's not because of me and he says well you did an allocution that nobody's ever – what was that thing you did in court? He asked me. He says, I did an allocution. He goes, well, whatever that was, it's never, it hasn't been done in traffic court or that type of court ever, and it went viral. And evidently there were seven Montana State University law school students in the courtroom, They went and they were third-year students. They went back to their law professors, asked them how this man was able to pull off an allocution, and the professors tried to hide it. The city fathers tried to hide it. And, next, and they tried to recontract him all the way through right before Christmas of 2003. And I kept telling him, don't go back, don't go back, don't go back. They have nothing on you. And if they haven't issued a warrant for your arrest, that means you, you won. And so bottom line is on, on February 14th, Judge Carlson resigned from the bench. And she went to practice law in Florida. So um, we, it, like I said, we were told it had the impact. Uh, Bill went to a, a bar where, they, where he played foosball with his friends and and one of the gals there that was working in the bar um, was one of those third-year students, and this was in March of 04. and she told him that what she had done, the other students had let it be known, it created a fear at the law school, and that um, that's probably why Carlson basically just got rid of her, so there would be no more you know, ties with her and, and that decision. And, and the case was well, sealed. Well, I think, I think one of the things that, that it, um, you know, we have... Uh, in, in all these things, we have anecdotal and historical evidence that goes back a long, long, long way. <clears throat> and in the positive law, one of the things that I've, we've been doing is, is trying to place the logic and the history of that. So take oaths, for example, and oaths being a fundamental component that was reintroduced in Anglo-Saxon law or Anglais law under the reign of the Pippins and Charlemagne. So you know we've spoken about that, yeah? And yeah, that's that, that, and then the the Venetian commercial uh, system using oaths and promises and the commercialising of those to underpin their system. So they're using our honour against us. Yeah. Yep. So I think I think what I would be considering, and I and I just want to raise this, and then we'll we'll keep going. But um, and by the way, thank you for last week, Greg. I, I just I said it at the start, but I just want to say it again. Thank you for your contribution and your ongoing contributions, Greg. I mean, you you've got some. You're a fantastic contributor, and you've got fantastic. Well, apart from the fact that you speak extremely well, you, you've got a lot of history. Um, the I I have a feeling that we say the word elocution, which is its its present word. I have a feeling this goes back a long, long way to almost the most ancient rite that before a man is condemned, he has the right to speak. Yes? Yes, of course. Allocutus, Latin. Okay. Before anyone is condemned, they have the right to speak. And this is a right that goes so far back that it cannot be denied. If you deny the condemned the right to speak and of course in a magistrate's court you've already been judged you've already been condemned yeah. so when we talk about remedy in magistrate's court elocution is actually probably one of the few remedies available to you because under the magistrate's court everything is a summary judgment already yeah yes of course but, 
so the thing is um, it's 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 the right to speak on the record that is your right and the power is whatever you speak will be on the record and that's and and it's open ended so it's that it's your one opportunity to get all of that on the record um, and I want to explore that and make sure that that's in our notes as well so Greg once again thank you very welcome thanks for the opportunity to share thank you Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Frank. Um, looks like Dawn might have another question. Dawn, are you there? Hi, this is Dawn again. I'm just confirming what he said. That was Patricia Carlson on Bozeman, Montana, which is just ah. a few miles down the road from us. So anyway, <laughs> when he said that, I'm like, I know who you're talking about. Oh, very good. Thanks, so, Don. Yes, I just wanted to confirm that for everybody. He is correct. Very good. Okay, Thanks, thank you. Dawn. Bye. Bye. Okay. Let's, uh, back to our chat question uh, real quick, Frank. <clears throat> How much time do we have? Do we have a little bit of time to go over tonight? Yeah, absolutely. I've been away, so yeah. Okay, cool. All right, wonderful. What is the ultimate destiny of those that have and will die before a true system is established. Yeah, look, um, uh, I think, firstly, I, I, I was a non-believer that reincarnation, or the, I call it re-inspiration now, because I think reincarnation is this idea that... Um, I had a reaction against because I used to see these people going on television saying I am Krishna or I am Jesus Christ and uh, it, that never sat well with me. But I was, for years, I was, you know, up until, in fact, this year, I was a uh, strong anti-believer in the system until I realized that over 100 billion flesh vessels, 100 billion plus flesh vessels have lived in the last 10,000 years and that um, there is no way that uh, there's only been one driver per vehicle, that many of us, and I probably suggest almost all that are on the call, have almost certainly been here before more than once. So the ultimate destiny is a question of, I mean, a question of, if I, if I read what people would normally say, the question is implying, is um, if people die today, um, what happens given all this changing? Well, under the come to one heaven, hell is ended. And that's already established. That was established um, several years ago. It's a done deal. It can't be changed. It's sealed and it's validated. So as far as people dying and uh, doing the wrong thing or dying and uh, and not seeing um, the system on earth, that part of it means that everyone is forgiven, whether they've died a 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, or will die in the next six months. Uh, as far as, as um, those that do pass relative to the new system on earth, uh, I feel that there is enough evidence to suggest that people are already talking about subjects that they wouldn't talk about now, that there is an openness, that there is an, uh, an acknowledgement that we are going into a historical age of awareness. And I would suspect that anyone that passes now, particularly those, even those that have come to this information that may die. I, I had a, a, a widow contact me about a, a fellow who loved reading Eucadia and passed. And my feeling was, although I can't prove it, is that even now if people are going to pass in the next year or so, that they're going to be far more aware of information than those who passed 100 years ago. So I don't think it affects whether someone dies today or tomorrow. Are we suggesting that there's going to be a billion people that die or a hundred million people that die? I don't know numbers. 
but I don't think the issue this time should be the numbers. There's been terrible, terrible uh, tornadoes, as you know. Everyone knows it's gone through, and we're not out of the tornado season yet. But I don't believe this is part of some great punishment. So, yeah, I've, I've answered a few aspects of that question, but they're big questions. It's big issues. Um, but I, I am optimistic. I really do believe that everything is and is going to be okay because of what we're doing to change. So what you're saying is that it, it, um, the energies and the awareness should affect the past as well as the present and the future? It, absolutely. Only on this dimension does time play a linear role. On the other dimension, awareness affects the past, present and future. We have already, we, I mean we as in you and Ron and Greg and Gerald and, and Ray and 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 uh, uh, Dawn and 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 all the people that have been involved. I'm sorry if I, you know, obviously can't name everybody, but you know, all the people that are being involved are having an incredible effect, a tangible effect on the past, present, and future of this planet and of all that have lived and will ever live. It's amazing. So then that goes back to the, the, the powers utilizing what we talked about earlier. Use our powers wisely. Use our powers wisely. And don't be suckered into the system that desperate. The system needs us more than ever to continue to visualize their dream. Because we are the ones that visualize and have the power to manifest They've lost that power. Remember, they're cut off. They're cut off spiritually. That's a, you know, I don't know that people still find this um, this controversial. But when you look at the design and the symbolism throughout Eucadia, that symbolism isn't some secret surreptitious um, uh, trickery. We're very open that those symbolism through Eucadia is proof that the spiritual world is united and that the ruling elite stand for nothing. They have no spiritual power whatsoever. So they are more desperate today than ever before to perpetuate fear and have us visualize that because they are cut off. And that's why we've got to stop reinforcing it by spreading fear and not 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 deliberately but unwittingly you know every time i get an email and someone's spreading fear and more fear i know they're not doing it deliberately but we are still actively reinforcing the existing system because we keep visualizing the problem and not the solution so that's really how they can continue. I mean, we're, it's, we are allowing them by allowing them to use the fear tactics to manipulate our energies and our power. So, and, and you know, that's a pretty powerful statement right there in itself. Well, it, it's even being more specific. In this battle, and it's not a war because the war is over, and I really want to make that clear, the war is over. Okay, people shouldn't be saying, well, what if this happens or that happens? The war is over. We are now battling to bring to an end a refusal to acknowledge that fact. But in that battle, it's not the general population and their fear that is the energy. The fear that they need, the power they need, is the hundreds of thousands that belong to that loose affiliation we call the truth movement. That is the key. The key is what the truth movement does around the world in the next 12 months. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. That's very powerful. All right, next question. I think this is going to be a good question uh, to go to next here. What is your experience with hyperspace archetype visualization techniques? 